This is Richard Ross with the story of Albany, hub city of the great Willamette Valley in the state of Oregon. And Albany has a fascinating story to tell. It has come a long way since the day in 1846, the year of the great wagon trains, that the first settlers arrived here and named it for their hometown in New York. Since Walter and Thomas Monteith bought the squatter's claim to the town site from Hiram Sneed for $400 and a horse in 1848, Albany has come a long ways. As we see it today, a vibrant, practical city with its eyes on the future, it's difficult to visualize the day when the first house was built at Washington and Second Streets in 1849. But Albany today does look ahead, and for reasons many of us might not suspect, the passerby looks at the great new craft paper plant on the northern outskirts of town and passes Waverly Lake alongside the highway where the timber carnival is held and figures these are the things the city lives for. Well, it does, for these and a number of others. And it is those other enterprises we want to talk about. Enterprises concerned with the production of the metals of tomorrow. It wasn't many years ago that the dictionary listed titanium as a useless metal. And even today, many dictionaries don't even list zirconium. These are the metals of tomorrow. And Albany is the world's greatest producer of them. And the story of these metals almost reads like science fiction. You've heard of the man who worked a lifetime to perfect a universal solvent, a solvent that would dissolve anything, then found he had nothing to keep it in. Well, the men of Albany have tackled a problem that sounded almost as impossible, and they accomplished it. To tell the story, let us go to the Bureau of Mines and meet Mark Wright, the acting regional director. Mr. Wright, while we're here in your chemical lab, maybe you could tell us what part the Bureau of Mines played in the initial development of the reduction of zirconium and titanium and other reactive metals. Well, Dick, in uh, 1944, when we really got going in this laboratory, we broke right into the picture of reactive metals. One of our first assignments was to work on a process for making zirconium. Fortunately, we were able to acquire Dr. W.J. Kroll, a uh, refugee from Europe at the time, to uh, help in our research. Uh, he had many ideas on production of many of the reactive metals. Uh, we placed particular emphasis on zirconium. Starting on a very small scale, we worked on through a little larger scale and uh, so on up the line. Did you actually get into the production of the metal then? Oh, yes. We finally reached the production stage along about 1947. Why are, why are these metals called reactive? It's uh, one of the names that's chosen to describe these uh, metals that are sometimes known as rare metals. It uh, just happens that it uh, is a little more descriptive than the term. It, it's a metal metals. that's particularly hard to reduce, is that right? That's correct. It is very, they are very difficult to reduce and they react with the atmosphere to uh, take up impurities from the atmosphere. Consequently, most of the work must be done in vacuum mm -hmm. or in uh, inert atmospheres such as helium or argon. I'm curious about uh, why the uh, Bureau of Mines decided to locate here in Albany. Well, that's quite a story, Dick. Uh, at the time we decided to put a laboratory in the Northwest, the war was on and uh, materials were scarce. We started to look for a place that was available. It so happened that old Albany College had left this campus and it was available at a reasonable price to the government. After examining it, it appeared that it could be made over into a metallurgical laboratory Consequently, we went ahead with it on that basis. So it was primarily because the buildings were here and available and could That's be right. had at the proper cost. Right. Well, now, you're no longer producing zirconium in the Bureau of Mines, I assume. Uh, what, what now is your mission in regard to these reactive metals? Our part in the production of zirconium and titanium now is one of research and development. Uh, the Bureau ordinarily never gets into production. In the case of zirconium, it did for some time, 
but now it's back in the line which it should be in, which is developing newer processes or improvements in the processes for making these two metals. And I presume testing the metals that are produced, is that right? That's correct. We do testing on metals that are produced by some other companies and even on Japanese zirconium. Uh, how large a budget do you have here in Albany to do this job? We have about a $2 million budget annually. One million of it is bureau funds. The other million dollars comes from uh, funds furnished by other defense agencies, such as AEC, the Army, and so on. One other thing I'm curious about, and that is where the ore for zirconium comes from and uh, exactly what it is. Uh, the zirconium ore that is used in the production of zirconium here at Albany is produced in Florida. However, the first zirconium metal made at Albany was made from sands that were mined in southern Oregon. Down around Coos Bay, was it? That's right, down around Coos Bay. Uh, why, then, can you tell me, uh, does the industry continue to remain here in Albany if, for instance, the metal or the ore is now found in other parts of the country? Well, I believe the answer to that, Dick, is that there is a plentiful supply of trained people here in Oregon, some of them brought about by the fact that we operated our plant here for such a long time. Another thing, no doubt, is that it's very easy to hold a crew together in a good place like Oregon. It's a nice place to live. How many people do you have working here at the Bureau? We have about 300 people now, Dick. About a third of those are professional and technical people. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Wright, for talking with us about it. Thanks. Surely. Mr. Wright mentioned that the Bureau of Mines has turned the reduction of zirconium over to private industry. This is that company, the Wacheng Corporation an American firm with a long history of efficiency in the production of comparatively rare metals. Hua Chang in Chinese means great development, and indeed it was a great development that bloomed from the day when K.C. Lee, a Chinese-American educated in England, put his knowledge and training in geology and metallurgy into the formation of a corporation in 1914 that was to deal in the lesser-known metals. Included in the background of this pioneering metals company is a vital contribution to the Allied effort during World War II, at which time Hua Chang supplied urgently needed tungsten from its foreign and domestic mines. The Hua Chang Corporation is an old company in the field of high temperature refractory metals, but until now, most of their work has been with the smelting and refining of tungsten. But recently, the company's interests expanded to include metals such as titanium, zirconium, hafnium, and tantalum. Zirconium is presently their greatest interest in Albany. Although few people have heard of zirconium, I was surprised to learn that it is the sixth most abundant structural metal on the Earth's crust. And because of its abundance and easy availability, the future development of zirconium depends almost entirely on its production. In a moment, we'll meet a man who whose efforts have been in a large measure responsible for the fact that zirconium today sells at about $14 a pound, while as recently as 1943, the cost was $630 a pound. Watchang's president, Casey Lee, has appointed a man, a 38-year-old metallurgist, Stephen Yee, as his manager of the zirconium division of the Watchang Corporation. He's in his office now. How many plants do you have here in Albany? We start with operating Bureau of Mines zirconium plant under AEC contract. Since last August, we built our new zirconium reduction plant in North Albany. In North Albany now, we have two plants, one zirconium reduction plant and one zirconium carbide plant. Now, we're starting to build another one called the zirconium purification plant. How many people do you have in your employ? We employ right now about 200 something some people. I wonder if you could describe for us uh, the, the, the processes you go through in making zirconium. How, how is it made? A possible, uh, our manufacturing manager, James McLean, could tell you better on uh, this question. All right, can I, can I see him? 
Jim is in purification plant now. You can see him in the purification plant. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Yee told me that you could explain to us how you make zirconium in this plant. Well, that's a pretty long story, <laughs> Mr. Ross. Well, we've got a short show. Could you <laughs> boil it down? Well, uh, we have several processes. First, uh, we make zirconium carbide from zircon sand. Uh, then we go through a chlorination process, a separation process, another chlorination process, and finally a reduction process. And our final product is sponge, sponge zirconium. Then we get zircon from a black sand, is that right? Yes, sir, that's right. This sand is from uh, Coos Bay, Oregon. It's typical of all of the Oregon beach sands and other beach sands all over the world. This is put through a, an ore dressing process to uh, produce this pure zircon. This pure zircon, as you see, is a very beautiful material, much the same as your gemstone zircon. And then from that, we come up with this Zircon sponge. Yes, that's zirconium sponge. That takes about seven days from the zircon sand stage to the sponge. Well, now, how long does it take from the from the beginning to the end of this process? In uh, other words, uh, let's assume one particle of sand. How long would it take for it to come out at the other end, uh, zirconium sponge? It will take about a week. How much zirconium are you producing here? Well, right now, we are the largest producer of zirconium in the world. We produce about 720,000 pounds a year. Can you tell me what uses you're putting zirconium to? What, what are we using it for today? Well, Dick, uh, the large use of zirconium today is in nuclear reactors, uh, which are being produced almost exclusively like by the AEC. Now, where do they put zirconium in their nuclear reactors? Well, zirconium goes right into the heart or core of the nuclear uh, nuclear engine. It's used uh, as a tin can to put around the slugs of uranium. Uh, it's also used, though, for boiler tubes. Uh, you wouldn't put uh, a good an an analogy would be uh, you wouldn't put ice cubes in your furnace at home uh, when you want to get heat. You wouldn't put other materials in a nuclear reactor because they would steal the heat. Zirconium has a property of not absorbing the neutrons or the heat of the reactor itself. Let the heat go right through. There are other elements that will do the job as well, but they don't have mechanical strength. They can't be fabricated and all for many other purposes. But actually, uh, uh, that isn't the only use for zirconium. We have about 50 uh, applications right here in this plant where we're using zirconium for right. corrosion resistance. Uh, resists hydrochloric acid very well. You have a sample of it. Is this a sample of zirconium yes, here? Yes, a piece of uh, zirconium sheet. This is the way it looks after it comes out. Huh? How much One, would you uh, say this is worth? Well, that's about $25 worth of sheet zirconium. Pretty expensive product right yes, now. Yes, that's right. You um, hope that you can get it down in the future? Yes. Cost? Of course, uh, commercial zirconium is cheaper. Mm -hmm. Now, our product, uh, a zirconium sponge, will go from here to the Oregon Metallurgical Corporation where they will make an ingot of it. That's where they make, the, that's where you end up uh, with a usable metal, not a that's sponge That's right. Form. And once it's consolidated, then it can be rolled out into sheet or manufactured into boiler tubes or cast into valves and all other sorts of things. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. McLean. We'll go over to Oregon Metallurgical and talk to them a little bit more. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thanks again. In order to follow the production of zirconium one step further, we're going to talk to Steve Shelton, who is Vice President and General Manager of the Oregon Metallurgical Corporation here in Albany. Mr. Shelton, nice to see you. Dick Ross. Nice to see you, sir. Now, we've been talking about zirconium and its production up to the sponge state. I understand you take it a few steps further. Is that right? Yes, we take the sponge and make ingots out of it. Of course, we've got to have the metal in massive form before it becomes of any use. But we take the first step towards making ingots in the direction of converting that, of course, to mill shapes and products that are eventually used in such things as atomic reactors. 
Now, uh, zirconium is not the only metal you're concerned with. You're more primarily concerned with titanium, isn't that right? Well, on about a 50-50 basis, we melt uh, titanium. Titanium has essentially the same chemical and melting properties as zirconium. So we are uh, strong in titanium, but we also melting zirconium. Are these the, uh, what we call ingots here, these big uh, cylinders that we're looking at? These particular uh, ingots are what we call the first melt ingots. They will be melted again to get better soundness and better physical properties. And uh, while we're on the subject of properties, just what are the physical properties of titanium? The physical properties of ti uh, titanium are very similar to the physical properties of steel. That is, you can make very hard, strong alloys or softer alloys but covering essentially the same physical properties as a steel, but the advantage of titanium is that it has only 60% of the weight of steel, so you get a strong strength-weight ratio with titanium as compared to steel or any other metal for that matter. Well, what uses are, uh, now I understand that most of your production or all of it is it going to the government right now? Most of our uh, output is going to the government. In general, the zirconium is for the Atomic Energy Commission, and the uh, titanium is primarily, almost entirely, for the aircraft industry. Well, how do they use it now? They use uh, titanium, of course, in both airframes and in jet engines as forgings, as sheet, and as mill shapes or structural components of uh, aircraft. What uh, other uh, uses do you anticipate zirconium might, or rather titanium might be put to? Of course, titanium, we hope will and expect it to spread into many uses as the price gets lower because of its strength to weight ratio and its tremendous corrosion resistance in acids and seawater and various and sundry other things that uh, give it particular desirable properties. For example, we have here castings uh, that we are making. These are, are parts for valves and pumps 